Hey, everybody, welcome to The Wrong End of the Snake. It's a webcast about audio, touring, and the relationships we have built between our road families. Tater and I have had an 18-year relationship on The Wrong End of the Snake with bands like Ted Nugent, Kid Rock, Slash, Stone Temple Pilots, Prophets of Rage, Iron Maiden, and most notably, 10 years with Linkin Park. My co-host, Kevin Tater McCarthy, is a world-class monitor engineer with over 30 years in the business. I'm very proud to call him my friend. He has nine Top Dog Monitor Engineer of the Year awards and two Parnelli Monitor Engineer of the Year awards. I'm Ken Van Jordan, a.k.a. Pooch. I am a front of house engineer with three decades in the music industry. I'm a three-time Grammy-nominated recording engineer. I have eight Top Dog Front of House Engineer of the Year Awards, and I am also a winner of the Parnelli Front of House Engineer of the Year Award. Let's do a little housekeeping. Uh, please use the chat window of the Zoom app to communicate amongst yourselves. If you are streaming from our YouTube channel and you want to be able to ask questions of our guests, register to be on the Zoom call for future episodes. Links to register are in all of our social media. If you have any questions for our guests, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom app. We will answer as many questions as possible during the hour and then answer any leftover questions in our Q&A overtime episode. Look for that to be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a few days. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to visit our social media, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook is at wrong end of the snake. Uh, Tater, why don't you tell us about our guest this week? Oh, it looks like Tater is locked up there. Uh-oh. You still with us here, Cheryl? You there? I'm here. I'm here. It does. Tater's, <laughs> Tater's frozen there. Tater is frozen and broken. All right. Well, <laughs> oh, looks like he's signing off away. and coming back. I'll tell you what. I'll introduce you. How about that? Oh, um, sure. <laughs> for the last 20 years, Cheryl has been a tour manager and an accountant for Blondie slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators, Billy Talent, Todd Rundgren, Meatloaf, Steven Tyler, Donna Summer, and many others. She started her career working as a publicist in the late 80s and early 90s, where she transitioned into artist management and PR. Around the year 2000, she was offered a touring position with Luther Vandross and fell in love with touring and live events. Everyone, please welcome Cheryl Hall. How you doing, Cheryl? I'm good. I'm good. I love the little the, the clapping. That, that's, that <laughs> it's good. so great to see you. Our our <laughs> audience are very enthusiastic. Um, they love have, seeing our guests. Um, Thanks for coming. Thanks for giving us your time and and uh, coming and, and talking with um, with me because uh, apparently Tater's not coming back. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> he must have uh, he must have crashed and burned in this world of uh, our computers. Uh, he evaporated into the ether. But <laughs> in this world of our our computers being everything these days. Oh, he is. is he back? Woo He's back. Look at that. All right. Well, Not we've already asleep. welcome back. What happened? Uh, not good. Um, not good. Crash not and burn. Good. All right. Um, everything. I'm just double checking my. Sorry about that. I um, I used my phone up here as my little teleprompter, and it fell. Oh no! Right onto my computer keyboard, and all of a sudden, um, the screen went blank. And <laughs> I hope everything's working. So oh, here we no. go. Where are we at? What did I good. miss? You sound hey, good and you're back. We've already introduced her. We we had the crowd went okay. wild when she was introduced. And uh, so <laughs> we're about to get started did, here. Okay, the crowd was good. Okay. Yeah. The crowd was really good. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sounding all right and everything. Okay, great. You are. Sorry about you're good. that. I mean, I, yeah, it's okay. Gotta, hey, I got to fix that system. So we're in, the, we're in the world of computers these days. And yeah, computers and crash all the time. Pretty nice. Uh, dent in my computer now oh right? no oh no it must have gone pretty hard uh, all right on to bigger and better things <laughs> well uh welcome back um yes, so cheryl um why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started like where you where did you grow up and how you got into the music business and and um yeah i mean tell us that i grew up in new jersey 
um, hung around in Philly all the time. I was in South Jersey, not North Jersey. Um, so I would kind of just like go, um, and I was always around the music industry, but there weren't a whole lot of women in the, in the music industry, um, especially the touring side back, back then. And um, I had a friend who said, if you go back to college and get your degree, I will, um, I'll hire you to be a publicist and work with me on, with my company, blah, blah, blah. So I went back to school got my associate's degree in music and video business and then went on the rest is history just did the PR thing for a couple of years and uh, then got into management artist management um, did that for a long time and then fell into touring and never looked back <laughs> so, so and PR, PR was in the music business industry though yes it was all of it was in the music industry okay. so I started out doing like all those uh PR for like a lot of 80s bands. So one of the first clients that we had was actually, I don't know if you remember Trickster, but that was one of my first clients. Yes, yeah. Trickster. <laughs> I, I mixed monitors for Trickster. Yeah, Tater mixed monitors for Trickster. You probably were working at the same time, I would bet. So yeah, them and like Bang Tango and some other bands, so. Sweet, and the hair 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 of hair metal. <laughs> heyday of hair metal That's right exactly i was i was part of the whole heyday of hair metal <laughs> and moment. what was it i mean obviously you gravitated away from pr what were some of the things that you didn't enjoy about doing pr that kind of led you down this path to being tour manager etc um i wanted to travel um and i wanted to be a part of the live event and pr is basically it's putting together a package to market your artist, basically, and and then selling that package to a, a bunch of um, outlets. You know, you and so it's basically once the creative part is done of putting everything together, and you're funneling it out to all of the um, industry publications. It's a matter of like being on the phone and just doing follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, sell, 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 sell the pitch, 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 and. I enjoyed the creative side of it, but then the pitch part was just kind of, you know, um, I give a lot of credit to publicists because I just, I just realized that that was not really where I wanted to be. Um, it's a wonderful position, but it's just a very, once you finish with the creative part of putting it all together, the pitch part isn't as much fun as I thought it was going to be. And, you know, being a part of the concert and the actual event is much more fulfilling for me. So. Got it. And so what was your first opportunities into um, touring with bands or whatever? What was, how did you, how did you get into that? Um, well, I did, I, you know, I had my bands that I worked with in the management capacity. Actually, one of the first bands was Age of Electric. So Todd Kern's first band. Um way back in wow early so you go back with todd a long time i didn't know that yeah so um i worked with a management company called invasion group and we co-managed um age of electric with them um with the pr firm that i was with and uh so we put together the tour across the country did all the press the day-to-day -day press and also booked the venues um and all of that so that's kind of where i saw like the touring side of it and then I would go out with other artists that I was with on the baby tour so I would drive the van and um, be that person on the road with the baby band um, thus meeting a lot of promoters and other people in the industry and that's kind of where it linked up and then I did like Woodstock in 99 I worked in the artist compound and I was like this is amazing so kept in touch with those people and just let, you know, kind of fell into the, like I said, the whole thing. My girlfriend decided that she wanted to not tour anymore. Um, she came from a management background as well. Her name's uh, Donna Christopher, used to be Donna Brainerd. So she decided she didn't want to tour. She um, ended up getting married to Kevin Christopher, who's my partner in Nobody Left Behind. And um, when she stopped, there was an opportunity for me to step in to touring. So basically by default she left she recommended me I had a couple other people recommend me for the position and then that was it then I had all my mentors and all my touring gurus and people that influenced me and taught me how to how to do it and how to who, who were the mentors let's hear let's hear a little list of names there oh okay so um Joe Lenane is my biggest mentor he passed away actually um in 2007 
Uh, he was on tour with uh, Maroon 5 at the time and passed away right before Christmas. And he was my biggest mentor. He took me under his wing. He taught me everything about production, then proceeded to um, help me with everything, um, breaking into the tour management side when I crossed over, as he put it, you, you know, you crossed over uh, onto the dark side. I wanted you to stay in production <laughs> and you crossed over. And the first tour I ever did on the tour management side was um, Meatloaf. And I worked under Jason Rafalian, Bob Quant, and Bill Barclay, three people. Um, and good names right there. Yeah. So um, they all, you know, taught me everything uh, on that side of it. And I just felt like a sponge and I soaked it all in so that when I was finally ready to, you know, become a, a butterfly, I guess, I don't know, a bird, a, a big baby, not go from baby bird to big bird. <laughs> Um, I took everything that I learned from them. I mean, Bob Quant, I always call him like the, the calm he is and everything that he does, he brings peace to no artist would ever know there's a problem when he's the tour manager. And that was kind of the way I always strive to make myself, um, as a tour manager, I wanted to be that person that the, you know, the artist could count on and never know any of the problems that we might have behind the scenes um, because you never want them. And yeah, both, both Tater and I have toured with Bob and he's, he's amazing. He's uh, he does an amazing job. Ceiling could be on fire and Bob's yeah. calm and cool. Like, nothing yep. nothing to worry about on fire. here. We'll take care of it. Yep. Yeah. Love Bob. Exactly. So, so that's a, that's an amazing uh, uh, mentor to have. Yeah. Um, and, and so when you worked under those guys, what, what role were you? Were you working as a production assistant or were you working as their assistant or how did you, how did you get to meet Bob Kwan? I was the road manager. Um, so I took care of the band and he took care of um, Meatloaf basically. Got it. You know? So, and you know, Meatloaf, he, you know, he goes through and, you always know when you, at least what, what, it's not a long lived all the time position as the tour manager there. So, ah, um, understood. Yeah. Copy that. Except Bob Quant. Bob Quant, he can go back whenever he wants. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and that's true. I think of all of his clients, they all say, yeah, yeah anytime Bob wants to come back, he can. Um, he, he has that reputation dude. definitely yeah. of, of a guy that pleases the hard, the hard, harder, the more demanding artist. Yeah. 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 We've actually asked him to come on this and uh, he's just one of those guys that is like, nah, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a, a, you know, quiet guy. I don't really like talking about what I do and, you know, and that's just how he is, you know? So, um, uh, but anyway, he's an amazing dude. Um, From Detroit. Talk, talk a little bit about, I know that nowadays, thank goodness, um, everything is becoming a little bit more equal in the sense that we're seeing a lot more women in this industry. But I think when you started, you probably weren't seeing a lot of road manager women around you. Um, and, and tell us like how that felt and, and how you, how you navigated through that. Cause I'm sure yeah. you've been through some weird stuff <laughs> as a woman I, in, uh, coming up in this industry. You know, and, and it's a thing that I get asked a lot and I actually never really, I never looked at it that way. Like, oh, I'm a woman. And so, you know, they're going to treat me differently. Cause I always, my whole life, I was always, I always had more um, male friends. So I was always kind of part of the boys club, if that makes sense. And so coming into this, even though it was predominantly like a male dominated field, I never felt like I got treated differently. Um, I felt like I was respected by my peers um, and that moving my way in, I, you know, like I said, I had really good mentors. So those people taught me how to be the best version of myself and how to never take anything for granted and to always um, just, you're only as good as your last tour. You're only as good as your last show. You're, you know, and if you have one bad show that could, you know, ruin you basically in, in this industry. So just keep that in the back of your head and always strive to be the best. Um, the only time I ever had any like issues is sometimes on tour when back in the earlier days, 
some some countries that you would go to weren't used to seeing a woman in that position so that was the only time I ever really felt it and usually I had a strong enough production manager or somebody that was on my side to say like Quake for instance or um, you know you have to deal with her like I'm not settling the show with you you need to settle with her and you know or they would sometimes there was little like things where you would just feel like, oh, okay, this guy really doesn't want to deal with me because I'm a woman, but that's okay. Because by the time we're done with this show and this settlement or whatever it was, you're going to respect me. So um, you kind of went into it with that attitude and I never really felt like, so yeah, there's not a lot of us, but I feel like we're all really, the people that the girl, the women that are here are really, really good at what they do. And I think when we had Janine Edwards on, she kind of echoed those pretty much the same statements you just had about about what what was just said there, didn't she? I, I think it was pretty much the same. Yeah, I'm. You know, it's really great to hear because there yeah. are I. You know, I have spoken to other women in this industry that would, you know, had whatever, some sort of nightmarish experience, you know, starting up in this industry. You know, in the 80s and the 90s, this was a predominantly male dominated industry. And there was, you know, some it was it was a time period where women weren't being treated appropriately in a lot of ways. Um, and so it's, it's really good to hear, you know, Janine kind of said the same thing and you did that you demanded respect of people and people gave it to you. And that's that's really uh, uh, great to hear. And, and so I think people can take that women can take that from that, that that you have to demand respect and you have to be, you know, listen, I'm just another one of the boys here and I'm good at what I do. So treat me that way, you know? Um, yeah. And the other, I mean, I will say though, when I was a publicist in the eighties, like there was, I actually felt it more in that industry. Like I went, when I would go to shows and I'd be like, yeah, I'm the publicist for this band. And then people would look at me like, Oh, you're the publicist. Right. And, how'd you get that position? You know, like, I, and I was just like, yeah, you know uh, what? I went to, I went to college and studied yeah, for it. Yeah, and you they can me. F off yeah. over there. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but I did, I did actually in that, you know, and I think part of the reason transitioning into touring, coming from the background that I came from, um, that helped me a lot too. You know, like, because I had a lot more knowledge of all of it, the well-rounded side of it, because I came from the other side when a lot of people that come into touring are don't know the management side, the PR side, or how to deal with that side specifically, or like, yeah. don't have, you know what I mean? So I feel like maybe I had an advantage too. Uh, let me ask this real quick. Now that we're kind of on the, on the, on the woman's side of things here, uh, how is it dealing with bands, wives? Bands family. Is there any different dealing dealing in that aspect of it? I guess I've been really lucky. I I mean, I love the families of the people that I work with, at least, you know, currently. Um, and I, you know, I feel like I don't know, there's always that saying, happy wife, happy, happy life, right? So um the the wives are just as important as the artist as far as keeping them happy while you're, while you're, while your man's on the road or, you know, like, so just making sure that everybody feels across the board, like they're being taken care of, I think is really important. And I think that you mold that from each tour to tour because some people need more and some people need less. And some people that you don't talk to the families as much, or you're not interacting with them as much. And then some people you have to, make sure that your every single little I is is dotted and T is crossed. So I think it's adapting and, and just making sure that everybody is happy in the camp and, and every camp is different. I know for me, that was one of, one of the best compliments I, I ever received was a, a band wife thanking me for uh, help, helping the artist, uh, you know, further his vision and help helping his, dream of what he was trying to do come true and i ne never had a compliment like that and that, that came in the last few years and i thought wow that was quite nice I, I, I yeah that's pretty cool it. when yeah. when another person outside that you know spends outside time with that you know sees that yeah. that's that's really great yeah, and that and you know we talk about that a lot how there are two family we both we all all three of us have 
two families going on. We have our own families, mm -hmm. but then there's 10 months out of the year where I have another road family that I'm living with. And if you merge those two things where, you know, a band member's wife can recognize that you're helping that band member, um, that's, I think that's particularly yeah. satisfying. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important, you know, where, you know, I mean, a lot of my closest friends are some of the, the band members' wives. So that's great. Uh, they're my female friends. So yeah, like right. that's kind of, you know, and I'm lucky that way, though, that, that I think that like there's a lot of tours where the bigger tours I find it's not as family oriented as the smaller tours um, because there's so many people that have to make that happen. Um, but, you know, I'm very blessed in the fact that the tours that I do do, most of them are very, very family oriented and the people that I work with are just amazing. So yeah. And then what, awesome. what about when you're working for a female artist and the, and there's a, a the significant other is a husband, a male and all that stuff. Is it, is it kind of just the same? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I've worked with a lot of female artists. Um, so, and it's been amazing. You know, it's, I think that there's a, because I'm a woman working with a woman that there's always that camaraderie that comes with that. Um, but you know, you're always taking care of the husband and the kids and whatever comes along with that too. Um, but I think that there's, you know, there's kind of like a little bit of a girl, girl power thing when it's a, you know, that's cool know, artist. It's, it's yeah. you know, and there's some, nowadays, actually, there's, you know, some artists and female artists that prefer to have a female out there because we understand what the other person's feeling or, you know, a lot, a lot of times. So, and I've done, you know, I've done a lot of female tours. I've actually uh, heard of a couple of artists that prefer having female tour managers and production managers because they feel uh, like um, they are women are a little bit more detail oriented, maybe, um, and uh, they've had good experience with that. So I thought that was interesting that um, there's been a couple of male artists that I've worked for that that's their choice is to have yeah. um, a female tour manager, which is pretty rad. Um, so tell us, uh, get away from that a little bit. Tell us outside of COVID, <laughs> because all of our lives are screwed right now. But right. outside of that, um, how do you find work? Like as a tour manager, help us help a younger kid that's watching this to, um, to discover how this industry works and how you keep getting work. Is it truly just word of mouth and in between your clients, what do you do? Do you remain um, actively communicating with managers or how do you get work? I've been really blessed. Um, it is a lot of your relationships, the relationships you build with management companies and with artists um, that you get referrals and, you know, people say, yeah, she's, she's really good at what she does. So, um, you know, and, and that's kind of where it's gone for me. Um, I keep in touch with all the artist management companies and the uh, agents that, you know, so when there is a lull or I know there's a lull coming up, I'll reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm available from this time to this time. If you happen to have any artists that are looking for a tour manager or a tour accountant. Um, but I definitely keep in touch with the managers, especially for the artists that I'm currently working with um, all the time. And they keep in touch with me as well, you know, and I don't only sometimes work on the tour. Sometimes I work on other things and helping with um, just some of the day-to-day -day stuff that maybe that artist needs um, here or there um, just to, you know, keep, keep yourself kind of in the loop. And I, and I enjoy doing it. So it's not like a problem for me to do that, but that's pretty much it. And then for like up and coming and people starting out, I think it was an anomaly the way I got into the industry. Um, yeah, usually it's kind of the other way. Usually you kind of go from road to non-road. You went from non-road to road. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think that my transition into touring was a bit of an anomaly. Most people, if they start out doing like local shows and working as a runner or as a production assistant or um, something in venues, you can get recognized there um, and keep in touch with tour managers that you work with. Because if you're a great runner, sometimes they'll just give you a shot. It's happened to me um, three times on 
I was going to say team. when you when you get a runner or maybe some sort of um, uh, person who works for the promoter or something, you really you like them or you hit it off or they did something you really like, they give you their number and stuff and say if you ever need anything, right? Or exactly, or, yeah, yeah. And that, and I enjoy that because sometimes you know you don't know if that person actually ever wants to be on the road or if they're content just doing the day you know the local gig, and. Um, if you just put it out there to to that person that you're working with, hey, if you're ever looking for anybody, I'm looking to get into touring, that kind of thing, like just casually mention it. And then if the tour manager or the production manager is interested, they'll they'll take your information if they liked you, you know, and that's a way to get in. Um, so and I've seen like, you know, tours that I've worked on where we've actually hired the runner. <laughs> so cool. And, and that's, that's great. You know, I always, I am horrible. <laughs> I'm horrible at that, um, at keeping in touch with, you know, I too have been very blessed by, by getting, I continually get work. People call um, when I don't have work. Generally, I don't actively have to search for it. And I'm very blessed for that. Um, but on the other hand, um, I'm horrible at not staying in touch with people like, um, for instance, an example, uh, Steve Wood, who you know, um, he uh, is one of those guys that like always has work. And I always forget that all I should do is just call Steve and remind him that I'm not working right now. And I'll probably be able to get a job. He's probably got something going on. But because I don't call him, there are years that go by where we don't even talk, right? Like we don't even communicate. And, and so- I'm trying to stress across yeah. to the new kids that once you make a, uh, a connection with somebody, try to keep your name in there and don't be ridiculous like calling them every week, but keep your name at the top of their list by reminding them of who you are, you know, um, and that, that's a, a weird tightrope to walk, right? Like as a new person, you can't just keep calling the management office. Yeah. You know, at some point they're going to tell you like, don't call here again. We're tired of you calling us. Um, but, right. it, but on the other hand, you want to keep your name in the game, right? You know, in the list of people. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough thing to do when you're coming up. Um, do you have any advice for that? I mean, internships are good too. So like if you're doing like, say you're a runner at a local show, but maybe doing an internship um, at a management company or something, and you could split the time between the two, if you can afford to do something like that, because then you're going to learn both sides. And then if, for instance, that they have a baby band at a management company and they see that you've done both sides, then they might be more inclined to actually say, Hey, I'm going to give you a shot. Do you want to do this? And, you know, as long as the management company knows that you're interested in it, then, I mean, that's something that some people can do, you know, but I, I agree with you in not being overly aggressive about it, because if you get too aggressive about it, then the, you're just going to turn people off. And instead of making people want to work with you, you're going to make people not, they're going to disengage. And there, there's a, you know, if you want to bring in, just say a non-paid person on the road, there's still a pretty significant cost to a band to, to do that. Oh, right. right? That's I why mean, I said management company. Yeah. You can't yeah. really have an intern on the road because there's yeah. everything that goes along with that. There's hotels, there's bus right. space, there's catering numbers, there's everything. Um, I've actually had people say, can't you just bring me out on the road with yeah. you and and you know, I'll I don't need any free. money. I'll it's work not free. free. Yeah. I'll work for free, but it's like, you're not working for free. It's all the other costs of all this stuff. Yeah. There's quite exactly. a big cost and to have a person on the road. Unless you're gonna like just say, okay, well, you share a room with me, and that's probably not gonna happen. I would say that's not gonna happen. <laughs> so. But get ready after COVID, here it comes. <laughs> yeah, right. So we'll see. But I hear, I I hear that a lot, not. and I'll work so. for free. And and it's it's yeah, you might want to work for free, but the band has a a fairly significant cost for bus space and catering and and all that kind of stuff. It's it's a lot just to do that. So that's a tough way to go sometimes. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So um, let's switch gears here a little bit because in during this period of COVID, we've all had to kind of pivot a little bit and uh, try to 
figure out some way to to survive. Um, and I know that you've been a part of a bunch of different things to try to help the roadie community uh, in general. Um, you know, I know that you you helped me, um, you know, um, meet uh, someone in regards to healthcare. Um, but I know that you are doing, um, uh, have started a new kind of business uh, along with Quake and another partner, I believe, maybe you can help us to understand what it is, but it has something to do with financial help for roadies, right? What, what's it called and, and what are you doing? So um, basically it's Kevin Christopher, um, who's the lighting director. He does Journey and he did sl the last Slash Tour with me. Um, also a longtime friend. Like I said, his wife was the reason I got into touring. Um, so him, uh, he and Quake and I started, we went back to school to get our, um, back to school. We went back to training to get licensed as financial advisors. Now what that means is basically you're licensed as an annuities and life insurance um, person. So anything that's in the variable market, you would need to actually have somebody on your team, which we do. Um, we work with a company called SLD and, um, then you can explain to people. And I learned a lot in the trainings and the classes, and I'm still taking classes and I'm still getting more training, you know, week by week, I learn more and more, but we formed, um, the family motto for the SLD company is no roadie left behind or is no family left behind. So we formed a, com a side of that called no roadie left behind and did a website. So it's www.noroadieleftbehind.com. Um, we work, to provide financial education and um, hopefully in, it can give people some of the knowledge that I didn't have before COVID. Um, basically it helps to, we help people to plan for the future, for retirement, for any of their financial needs. Um, if they're in debt and they're drowning in debt, trying to help get them out of debt, um, especially after this year, if you're living on your credit cards, how to get that down first and then figure out ways and means to build money and funds and different income streams for retirement. Um, also helping people to understand the value of life insurance and the fact that too many of us don't have it and don't have health insurance. And it's really, 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 I can't stress really enough important. Um, there's a lot of, like uh, there's a woman she's working with the um the health alliance um that's actually on our website we work with them and i you know as i find people that need health insurance at a reasonable cost she helps to find um the best avenue for you to secure a uh, lower cost health insurance whether it's obamacare or whatever um specific to your needs and no. sorry go ahead um, and then as far as like the life insurance side of it, just knowing that there's options, there's a new thing called living benefits that's a part of life insurance where um, if you say you have a, a term policy and it's a 30 year term, there's no cash value to that, but you have a $500,000 death benefit. If you got sick, you could actually draw on that death benefit while you're alive to pay your medical bills or to pay expenses or whatever you need it for up to a, you know, a certain amount um, and depending on what exactly you have. So these are things that I didn't know before I got cancer and there are things that I can't get now because I had cancer, but had I known about them before I had cancer, I would have, I would have done things in my life differently. So basically No Roadie Left Behind is educating everybody in our industry so that, you know, Everybody, at least, I don't, you know, if you choose not to, to do it, then that's, but I want everybody to at least know about it so that have they the have the option. Um, and they're, you know, it's not that expensive to get a term policy. Um, there's other savings vehicles that like build you eight to 12% equity um, for retirement, um, things like that. So it's kind of just presenting the, the options and the vehicles to everyone um, so that they have a, a well, so that they have a, a knowledge base and then they can choose what they want to do. Well, it's, it's always nice for, for a person that's, um, you know, a road person in the entertainment industry to go to somebody in those line of works where you don't get the first hundred questions and they're not familiar with what you do. So 
And you go to somebody that's already doing that and they're, they can help you without all those questions. It's always, that, that's always a plus because you hate scheduling an interview with somebody like that, a financial advisor, and you got to get questions like, you know, who do you work for? You say the band and oh, do you get to talk to them? And, you know, all those questions, yeah, you, yeah. Hate, you know, <laughs> and so that always, it is always nice to go to somebody that knows what you do and you can skip all that minutia. But uh, I, I've been such a big uh, opponent, uh, proponent of the, the life insurance thing, just because I had a unique situation that happened to me when I was very young and I ended up buying a whole bunch of uh, whole term life policies and I didn't even really know what they were then. And I thought I got swindled and turned out it's been probably the best investment I've ever made in my life. And I see a lot of roadies going down and they have families and stuff. And I, and I, and they don't even have a term policy in place. And I think it's just so bad because you can get a term policy basically for less a month for, you know, a, a couple of days per diem, you know? Yeah. So I think just knowing that and getting that education out there, uh, is, is very important to stress to, to people in our line of work. And um, I, I just like, maybe you could go on for a second about a whole and term policy and, and how important and how, and how inexpensive maybe even a hundred thousand dollar term policy is. It's, it's not much, is it? No, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's pennies on the dollar, depending on your age and how healthy you are. Um, you know, obviously if, if you have pre existing conditions, that's going to affect it. Like, for, you know, for me, like I can't get a term policy. I can't get any new life insurance. So all I have is my old life insurance, but you could get a, you know, if you're healthy, young 30, say 35 year old with a $500,000 death benefit, it, it would be under a hundred dollars for a 30 year term. And that term is convertible into a, um, like, so say you just got the term for now, why we're not working and we don't know what we're doing then you could convert that into like a universal life policy um, or an IUL that would actually garner, um, that would become a cash value and a permanent policy. You could do that later. So take the cheap thing for now and then you can do the one that builds cash value later and the one that's permanent. You could do that one later. I, I always like to think of term life insurance policy, a term policy is like car insurance. You just pay it it is what yeah. it is. You don't, you don't ever see that money again. It's gone and it's done. But when you get a whole, a whole life policy, you pay into it and uh, you make money on it and it increases value. It's like kind of like a savings account. Yeah. And there's two different, there's whole life and there's index um, universal life, which is short-term IUL. So the, both of those are cash value um, life insurance products and there's different vehicles for each. I think it's important, you know, um, to especially stress in our industry. I mean, maybe coming out of this COVID situation, there's going to be a lot more people that are going to understand that way, you know, we have to have money set aside, you know, um, we thought we were bulletproof, right? You know, we thought our industry was, you know, uh, we went through 9-11 and we were like, this is when we're working the most is when there's a catastrophe for the rest of the world. And this is kind of the first time where we are, you know, totally our business is, com is completely stopped. Um, so I think that there will be people in our industry that will understand now um, how important it is to have, you know, some of these things. But I also think that when you're 20 years old, I know that when I was 20, I thought I thought I was bulletproof. Like, I'm not going to, you know, I don't need medical insurance. I'm fine. You know, I break a leg and I'm just going to keep walking, you know. Um, which is stupid. I mean, you know, um, uh, I, I was in a car accident when I was 16 years old and the total bill for that was upwards of $3 million. Um, and had that happened to me and not had health insurance, I'd still be paying for it now in my fifties. Right. Um, so it, it's, I can't stress it enough when I meet a younger person in this business, even if you're in your, you know, twenties, if you're 22, you still need to be buying some health insurance and some, you know, some uh, life insurance, in my opinion. Um, I hate to be, you know, the, the dad figure of like, come on, kid, you got to do it. But um, oh I wish that I did what Tater did, which was, you know, he fell into buying some life insurance at a young age. Um, Cause I didn't start buying life insurance until I was in, I don't know, my late thirties probably or early forties. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to stress it enough. And it's really awesome that you are, um, you know, focusing on trying to help people in our industry. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll get some people to, to call you. Yeah. And it's free. It's free for everybody. So that's that's great. Like we don't charge for our time. It's just, so how do they find you? How do they find you? Um, it's just, it's www.noroadyleftbehind.com. It's that simple. And just go to the website, make an appointment. There's a portal there and it's a free um, financial needs analysis. And we can go through whatever you want to talk about. And it's, that's, that's just what it's there for and to help. And then if you, you know, decide to do something great. And if you don't, you just want to take the knowledge and run with it. That's great too. I just want to make sure people know about it. And I'm the same as you. I, when I was in my twenties, I was, I thought I was bulletproof. I, I didn't, I ran around without health insurance until I was um, in my thirties and, and then I got it and thank God I had it. Cause I thought I was healthy at the age of 50, literally, um, you know, I thought I was super healthy. I was running, I was exercising. I tried to eat healthy, you know, the whole thing. And I got diagnosed with cancer. So, and then following my cancer, I saw people around me, you know, younger and, you know, only 30 years old get diagnosed with cancer. Um, no signs, no symptoms, healthy as anything. And so it's, you know, you just never know. And, you know, I, I can't stress that planning for it is important, even though it's something that may never happen. Yeah. I mean, even if you only have catastrophe health insurance, like all your, you know, prepay stuff are like super high and like going to the doctor costs you $200. You still need to have some sort of insurance to cover that three million dollars of getting cancer (laughs) you know because three million dollars is going to sink you you know a thousand dollars is not you know you could be able to pay that off out over a year you're not going to nobody none of us in this industry is going to be able to pay three million bucks well i could tell you like just one shot like i used to get um a shot after my chemo sessions right so that one shot was fifteen thousand dollars just the shot goodness um each chemo treatment was like twenty thousand dollars i mean it was you know those are things that like and i'm I'm sure that it's discounted rates when you paying cash because you're paying cash but still what if it's 10 right so you know i mean it could it could literally sink you just by uh you know having having some sort of uh disease um, so can't stress enough if you're, tw- you know, if you're working in this industry, especially we get hurt, stuff happens, you know, um, you, you definitely have to have some sort of health insurance. I think. And I feel like in our industry, especially because we're such gypsies and our mindset is, you know, float around like a flower child. We just don't think about it. Like we, we don't. And there's, you know, you, you, especially if you have a family, think about the legacy and think about how they're going to get by if you're not here. Yeah. So 100%. But 100%. Cool. Um, do you still like what you do? Are you still excited to go back? Oh my God, I can't wait to go back. Like, I, you know, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, I'll still like continue to help people with the, the no roadie left behind, but like, I, I can't wait to get back on the road. Like my, my life, my dream, that was the one thing I will say, like, you know, everybody's like, Oh, what did you, when you had cancer, did you like, did it make you want to change things in your life? And I was like, no, what that made me realize is that I actually really love what I do and I can't wait to get back to it. That's like what it made me realize. I, I feel like I was born to live on the road and live out of a suitcase and be a gypsy. Um, you know, I feel, and I've dedicated my life to it. Um, so, you know, that was one of the things that was really, really hard about COVID was because, and I'm sure everybody went through it, you know, but just watching the thing that you've worked for and strive for, for 30 plus years, go away in an instant, like just snap your fingers and it's gone. And then everybody telling you, you know, well, you know, we don't know when it's going to come back. So you better go find something else, but they're not telling people that have like other jobs to do that. Just us, (laughs) like, like we're like, it's non-essential. And really, if you think about what we do is we are the one industry that brings everybody relief as a world and as a community by bringing music out, you know, like, and, and entertainment. And it's what people use as a release. That's not even 
you know, to, to get when there is a recession or when there is, when there, when things aren't good, you know, um, what do you do? You go to a concert, you go to a show, you go do something that makes you happy for a minute. Right. And that's one of the reasons I got into touring to begin with is because it, it makes a difference. You know, I feel like it, music saved my life many, many, many times over. And if I can be a part of bringing that to other people, since I'm not musically talented and I can't sing <laughs> or do anything <laughs> like that, at least I can be a part of the magic, right? So, and, now, and, I, and it truly is still magic to me. Uh, awesome. go, going back to the tour management side here, how, how tough is it going to be coming up when the artist uh, down from the promoter down to the artist is going to want to cut so many costs and at least we think they are um, and they're going to want to cut costs and cut this and cut that. And then you're going to have to tell crew guys uh, the, the money is going to be different this time and it's, can't do that. And this it's, it's going to put you guys in a pretty tough position. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be some stress there to deal with. I'm sure um, telling people that, you know, the salaries are going to be different and um, because I'm sure they're not going to go up um, coming back. So <laughs> how, how do you feel about that? How, and, and having those discussions and, and telling these guys, Hey, I, you've been struggling and haven't had any work for, for uh, let's say a year at this point. And uh, guess what? You're going to come back and make $500 a week less. How do you, how do you feel about that? How are you going to say that? How is that going to, how are those conversations going to go? Well, hopefully I'm hoping that, you know, when we come back, we come back with a vengeance and, you know, that we will not have to have many of those conversations. Um, I really truly hope that there's a way to supplement the income on the tours um, so that we can, you know, I honestly don't see us coming back doing half venues. I see us coming yeah, back either. doing, I don't see socially distanced concerts as a yeah. reality, just me personally. Yeah, um, it might happen. I just don't see that happening. And so I, I just don't, I don't think it's financially viable. I don't think that you can do that and be able to, you know, you and I, I've, I've been production manager and you've been tour manager on tours together. We've seen, you know, line items and the margins are close, even when places are sold out to the gills. So right. when you're talking about taking 50% of the money away, I just don't see it possible. Right. Yeah, not only that, like I just from a social distancing aspect, I don't see that as a reality because once the lights go down and the yeah. the, the, the band the rush to off, the stage, yeah, 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 exactly. Who's gonna keep them in their seats? Like, yeah. you know, and not for nothing, but just that alcohol. They're all gonna go to the front. They're all yeah. gonna, you know, whether it's seated or not. And then that that that's part of the problem, right? So I think that we have to wait until we can come back as a, as a whole. And then will there be extra costs? Yes, there will be extra costs involved because probably there's going to be testing, probably there's going to be, you know, but can we incorporate some of those costs into, it'll obviously be show costs, but can we find a way to offset some of those with something else? You know, like, um, uh, you know, actually I, I've been working uh, my other thing that I've been doing is doing settlements for this company called Veeps, which is an online platform, online ticketing for virtual concerts, right? Which is huge right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies out there and it could be an avenue where, you know, so some people in the beginning are maybe not going to want to come back to a live environment right away, or you, you're working with older artists um, where, you know, they, they are until they can get a vaccine, they're, you're, they're compromised, right? They don't want to put themselves in that position. So live doing a live stream and supplementing the income of the show with tickets sold online um, as a complete and separate entity, like, you know, how we do meet and greets and stuff, that might be something to look at in the future. Because you don't think meet and greets are really going to come back right away, right? I don't think meet and greets are going to come back at all. <laughs> I mean, they will, but I don't think not in the near future. No. And I, and I think virtual meet and greets may be the way you can actually, you know, you could do a Q and a session with virtual meet and greet, um, where you actually get to ask the, ask questions to the artists. Maybe you do like a round table or something of a hundred people and everybody gets a question instead of a photo. Do you know what I mean? Like getting pushed through a line, it might even be better, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Anyway, it's just some, some things that I think that there's ways to offset the costs 
for both the artist and the promoter um, to, to try to make it so that, or, or even increase. And once everybody does come back, it's ways that you can actually increase the revenue for both sides. I, so. It just makes me, it just makes me wonder that the, 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 the pressures, the added pressures, I think that are going to be on a tour manager coming back because I, I see management just going, um, uh, luckily not the managers, hopefully that I ever worked for or have in the past, but really demanding out of you telling people to, uh, instead of having 10 on a bus or eight, we're going to go 12 this time. Uh, hey, w- maybe some positions or vendors or somebody are going to have to double up in rooms and, and all that stuff. And it's going to be a, a tough, a tough position uh, to have to start spreading that word. And a lot of people are going to think, man, why did I come back to this? I should have changed when I had a, when I had a choice. Cause this isn't, this isn't what it once was. Um, and which is funny because one of the, when, when this first started, uh, I heard a lot of people saying, Oh, we're going to be on, it's going to be the opposite. It's going to be uh, only uh, five of us on a bus now or six because of COVID. And we all, we all know that was never going to happen. So um, I just think there's going to be a lot of added pressures on tour managers being the liaison between management, the band and the crews that uh, there's going to be a lot of um, tough conversations coming back. I, I kind of disagree with you a little bit in the sense of if you have any sort of reputation in this business and let's say you have, uh, you know, several clients that you work between, which, uh, you know, all three of us do, we, we work with somebody and it's kind of like their schedules work out to where you end up working for another artist, whatever. I think what's going to happen is that everybody's going to want to work. So then all of a sudden you become a hot commodity because you're like, well, I have three of my clients that all want me to work for them and they want me to work for me right now. And so then you, you end up in a position of actually being on top of that and being, well, hey, listen, if you want to hire me and so-and-so is offering me this, I think that salaries are going to be higher. I think it's going to be an wow. opportunity for us to to um, to uh, do better. That's just my opinion. I don't oh, know. I love it. I love that. Yeah. I love that. One. I, I want that way. That's the way I want. <laughs> I mean, I think that you're right in if someone doesn't have a reputation, if they're you know starting in this industry, I think they're going to have to make some compromises. But I think there's going to be work for everybody. There's going to be enough work. Oh, Everyone's going to want to work. Uh, but I think that if you do, if you are in a situation, if you're blessed enough to have multiple artists that all want you to work for them. I think you're going to be in that kind of situation. And I hope so. Yeah. I hope hope so so. too. I really do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I agree. I think that, um, you know, and I also think it's going to be on a case by case basis too, with each artist. I think that it's going to be working on the budgets with the management teams and trying our best not to ever have to have that conversation because obviously that's not a conversation anybody wants to have. I, you know, I mean, I've been on tours way before COVID and and many, many years ago where the artist just decides they want to save money, where they just clean house and hire cheaper people uh, in, or they like say, okay, well, you have to, you know, not anybody I'm currently working with, but like previously many, many, many moons ago, you know, oh, you need to take half pay on travel days or else you, you can go find another tour. And, you know, so I think those conversations have already been had. I don't think that's a a COVID or a not COVID thing. And I think it's a, it's down to um, the artists that you work with and, you know, how, what they, what they need to see. And, and if they're loyal enough to their crews, I really don't see them trying to, after they know that we've had such a hard year trying to cut our salaries. I think that everybody will be looking for other ways to, navigate that other than asking the people that have already been hit the hardest to. to Yeah. But I mean, you know, having said that, I also think that the costs are going to be exponentially higher. So somewhere they have to figure out where to get, you know, pull those costs from. And unfortunately in a, in a, we all know in a bill, the top line item is salary, right? So of course, any manager, any business manager, they look at that line item and they say, well, this is where we need to make cuts. But hopefully, um, I'm hoping that a, an artist and those people have an understanding that it's like, hey, we, you know, all of us in this industry just didn't work for 12 months. And you can't do that to me. Like all of a sudden, I'm working for half of what I used to work for. I don't, I don't think that that's going to happen. And I, and I hope, um, 
I hope it doesn't. But, um, you know, it, it's it is just like with COVID. We don't know when this is going to end and we don't know what's going to happen uh, to our to our salaries. So uh, it's an interesting I, I, I conversation. Always, I always like uh, th this aspect. And, you know, uh, Cheryl, you, you can present it to a band and say, hey, we're going to do this one off in Jakarta. And hey, it's a great, great money gig. Right. So we're going to play it. Problem is, we can't get our gear there. Right. We've all had those. Mm -hmm. And. You go to the band, you go, look, great offer. We can play it, but you're going to have to use local gear. This now oh, we don't care. We, we love to do those every once in a while. Oh, those are great. You know, no problem. No problem. No problem. Then you get there <laughs> Then they see it, the gear. Yeah. Right. <laughs> then they see the sound system. Then they see the lights. Yeah. And they forget about that conversation two months ago. when you said about, oh, it's a great money gig and this and that, and this and that they, all that, all that happiness when you said, oh, we love doing these and we, we don't mind doing one on rental gear, all that, all that goes away. <laughs> you forget about those conversations. Yeah, but I think that's going to change. I think you're going to see more and more. We're going to be doing those one offs. Yes. The gear that's there. Yes. Yeah. So, so they're going to have to deal with it. I, I get it. But we all know when they come off that stage and it's and it's that gear that they said it was OK. And then you get there and it's not. And they're all unhappy. Well, we don't have to deal with happened. that. Cheryl does. She gets yeah. in the car with them and yeah, they yell exactly. at her. <laughs> exactly. So I just think. Um, you know, we have these conversations, we, we do long tours, we have these conversations early and everybody's happy and you get on down the road and things are going good. And then they forget the, you know, forget some of this stuff. And, and then Cheryl's <laughs> taking the brunt of it in that, in that van ride back to the hotel. <laughs> I think though, I think just like we're expecting things to change. I think artists expect things to change too. They're going to, yeah. they're going to have to be more open to weird stuff I like that. Um, I sure hope so. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. But I mean, and it it's going to be a piecemeal opening, right? I don't think that the world is going to open up evenly, right? I think it's going to be true. Uh, I, I think it's going to be okay. Well, we can go here now. We can't go here. And it's going to be so there is going to be more of that jumping around and logistical. I mean, I hope that's not the case, but I, I foresee that. And I think a lot of it's just going to be navigating it when the time actually gets here and just figuring out the best path and figuring out ways to just make it work. We always make it work. You know Somehow. what I mean? That's what we do. We make it work. So throw money, throw money at it. Yep. Yeah. We, we will, we will figure out a way this too shall pass and we will figure out a way to make it work and the shows will yeah. happen and everybody will be happy. Hopefully. Um, you know, I really, I believe that in my, my heart of hearts. And yeah, I do too. I'm, I'm trying to remain positive about it and remain positive in that. That's going to be soon instead of yeah. six um, months from now. But. Re real quick while we're on this, on this uh, part, uh, do you have any thoughts on Brexit and what that's going to do and how much harder that's going to make the tour managers and accountants job? I don't because we don't really know what that means yet. We don't know. They don't know what it means. <laughs> They're driving know. freight from England the, to France but, right now and they don't know, you know, they show up at the border and they're like, nope. Yeah. yeah like, nobody knows what it's going to do. I don't think right now. It's going to be tough to plan for sure. It will be. A, it will be a headache for sure. But it, you know, like I said, there's lots of headaches in planning a tour. Like, I don't know. I just feel like that's all part of it. And part of the fun sometimes is like figuring out a way to make it happen and, and make it work. And like, then you can have, you have a sense of accomplishment. Like, I mean, I remember Pooch when you were in South America and all I heard about was how you got, you miraculously got the gear from point A to point B. It was, I think it was a, um, Kings of Chaos thing and like how amazing it was and I, you know like I was just like wow that's pretty, pretty amazing like, well you know what that had nothing to do with me that was me calling Steve at EFM and saying dude you gotta make this happen I don't know how you're gonna do it but put, put everything into a Honda Civic and drive it there I don't care um so Steve yeah i mean it's it's worker. it is just like everything else surrounding yourself with good people that handle that kind of stuff so um awesome well we've we've uh kind of run out of time here for our live uh, hour it always goes by super quick um but one yeah. kind of last question i always like to ask our guests is um what's you know and you've had some amazing mentors in your life what's the best advice that anyone has ever given to you you're only as good as your last gig 
<laughs> best advice because it's just something that stuck with me. And as long as you remember that and you never take anything that you're doing for granted and you never get complacent and you never just do the minimum, you know what I mean? I always try to overachieve on every tour I do. And I always strive for excellence is what I always be say. Better, yeah. Always learning, always t- trying to do the, the, the next thing, figure out the, ne- you know, but yeah, just, um, Never, ever, ever take it for granted and think that don't get, don't feel like, oh yeah, I have this gig now and it's mine forever because it's so weird. Like I meet people that work in this industry that get complacent, right? Like they get in their job and they're like, yep, I just do it. And this is what I do. I don't understand that. Like I constantly am striving to make somebody sound better when I'm a sound guy for them. It's not like I get to a point where I'm like, oh yeah, this is pretty good and then just stop and don't do anything. It's like every day I'm like, I'm trying to make them sound better, trying to do this better. And I'm sure you're the same way in your job as a tour manager. I'm trying to be better. Um, yeah. And so I always say it's striving for excellence. I, I like yeah, the word when you said minimum, flexible. do the minimum. Do the minimum. Yeah, I like I like that uh, um, that assessment of, uh, uh, of, you know, your job's on the line every day, people doing the minimum. I see a lot of that and that I've never been able to express that. And I'm gonna use that now. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just do the minimum. Do nope, the minimum. don't. Always. <laughs> yeah, and awesome. be flexible because, uh, and don't like, don't bring. Be flexible, yeah. Into into a into any camp, you always have yeah. to be flexible and be ready to jump on the fire that just started, and also know that every artist is different, and you're going to have to mold yourself to that particular artist and learn exactly what their needs are. Um, as a tour manager, you yeah. you can't go into each scenario with the, with the same mindset. You need to be accommodating, flexible, and just, you, I don't know, shapeshifter. No, that's great advice. I think that, that people don't, people get locked in their ways, right? And that you, as a tour manager, you can't be that, right? Like you have to constantly go with the flow, be flexible, change, you know, everything changes around you and you have to be flexible to it. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, listen, Cheryl, thank you so much for uh, donating your time. And I hope you uh, guys out out there got a little bit of uh, advice about how to be a better tour manager. Um, Thanks for coming. And uh, we love you. And it was really awesome that you came. Thank you so much. Sorry about the It was wonderful to be here. I thank you guys for having me. It was really fun. And I love you both. (laughs) We love you back. And we hope we hope that we're all working together sometime soon. That'll be fun. Yes. Um, speaking of striving for excellence, uh, next week on wrong end of the snake is David Morgan. David is an absolutely legendary front of house sound engineer, having worked in the business since the mid seventies. Uh, his clients include the Doobie brothers, Jackson Brown, Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins, Glenn Fry, Whitney Houston, Paul Simon, Bette Midler, James Taylor, Stevie Nicks, Steely Dan and Fleetwood Mac. I wish my resume looked like that. Um, He has 11 Tech Award nominations, including a one win and uh, six nominations for the Parnelli and uh, one win as well uh, for his work with Fleetwood Mac. Uh, So we're super excited to have Dave Morgan on uh, next week. If you are a sound guy, it's one not to miss. Uh, Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our videos. We have had over 500,000 hours of watch time to our channel. And we're very grateful that you've helped us to reach this milestone. Uh, Thank you. Subscribe and smash like on all our videos, share with your friends. We appreciate it. Uh, Also, don't forget, you know, we are a collateral damage business right now. Uh, We're still trying to get our elected officials to listen to us. Contact your local representative. Um, We own small businesses that have not had income since March of 2020. Please go to extendpua.org, wemakeeventsorg namm.org, and for mental health and well-being, uh, the roadyclinic.com. Uh, keep the pressure on, contact a representative in the House and Senate and remind them about our forgotten industry. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and uh, we'll see you again next week. David Morgan, thank you, Cheryl.